when I went up on that balloon um, and looked down, I've never felt fear like that in my life. Uh, some guys, they would jump out the balloon like it was getting off a bus. But it really, it, it was a raw fear that I've never experienced since. Um, and I very nearly refused. I will tell you that quite honestly. I got up to the door and my knees were trembling just like in the cartoons. And there were these American lads that were living in this in this house. So I was going to fly out with them. And the pilot was this old grizzled Vietnam vet who was flying a Huey. As you say, encroachment by NATO, which they said they would never do. Dave, 15 Chris. para, 15 para, 15, the parachute regiment. <laughs> how, yeah. are you? how are you, brother? I'm doing good, mate. I'm doing good. You said you were born in Kinloch Levin, is that right? That's right, in Kinloch Levin, yeah, small village up on the west coast of Scotland. And um, actually, it's a, it was a mountain warfare training centre for the Royal Marines. So we had a lot of lads from the village join the, the Royal Marines. Um, I'll give a shout out to one of my mates, Davy Scott, um, who joined. And then there was Billy McDonald, Colin McDonald, whole bunch of guys. I was raised there and there was very little to do. So what I did was I did hill walking every day um, after school. I went up the hills there and then at the weekend I'd go over to Glencoe, um, which is another area that the Marines used. So I'd spent most of my life outdoors. Um, <clears throat> then I went down to Glasgow to do a, um, an engineering course and um, I saw these guys uh, in Socky Hall Street one day with um, um, an advertising booth. And uh, at that time, all I was doing was just basically drinking at the weekends and I wanted something more to do. So I joined 15 Para. So 15 Para is now part of the uh, 4 Para, which is a reserve unit. And in those days, it was 44 Parachute Brigade. So it was made up of um, three TA battalions, 15 Para in Scotland, four para north of England and 10 para down in London and other areas. But it was a bit of a culture shock for me. Um, <clears throat> I'm from a very quiet little village in the Highlands and suddenly I go down to Glasgow and I'm among all these growling Glasgow bears. So uh, I made a lot of good friends there. Um, Glasgow... As we know, there's violence in Glasgow, but that's only one part of it. The people are some of the nicest and friendliest people that you could ever imagine. And I've got still got loads of mates that I keep in, in contact with. So um, it was a good experience for me, but I will tell you this. <clears throat> there was I've had fear in my life many times, but there was one incident that put fear in me that I have never experienced before or after, and it was my first balloon jump. Um, this was taken years later. That's the, that's the balloon there. So you went up 800 feet uh, with this. Um, my first balloon jump down at Bryce Norton, um, the, that was me just there. Uh, they just moved the parachute school from Abingdon. And uh, when I went up on that balloon um, and looked down, I've never felt fear like that in my life. Uh, some guys, they would jump out the balloon like it was getting off a bus. But it really, it, it was a raw fear that I've never experienced since. Um, and I very nearly refused. I will tell you that quite honestly. I got up to the door and my knees were trembling just like in the cartoons. And, um, but the PGI was really good. I was number four. And I said, I don't think I can do this. And he said, look, son, you've come a long way. You've got your maroon berry. Um, you know, you've gone through the course here. He said, just take a deep breath and off you go. So the other ones after that uh, weren't so bad. And the aircraft was like a, a walk in the park compared to that. And then I got offered a job with a company called Cable and Wireless. 
So they're a, quite an interesting company. They were actually owned by the British government. So what they did was they provided communications for the British Empire. For instance, out in Hong Kong, they had um, the biggest satellite communications facility um, in the world. <clears throat> so I trained down in Cornwall for a year, and then I did three years in the Middle East, and then I went down to the Falklands for a year after the war. We did comms for um, Biffy, British Forces, Falkland Islands there and other things. Um, came back from that, went down to Belize for three months. That was quite interesting. The Guatemalans were picking up a bit of a stir and they had Guatemalan SF patrols coming in through the jungle infiltration. So the Harriers used to fly low level and fire a burst into the canopies. Um, you could actually pick them up, uh, the Guatemalans on the, the radio, we used to listen to them there. Um, that situation could have become quite bad uh, if it hadn't have been for the Harriers and the British troops that were down there. So left there, and then I spent a year in North Yemen. Not a very pleasant experience. Um, place was just absolute chaos. Mm. I stayed in Sana'a, which is the, the capital, and all the other blokes ended up with hepatitis, um, except me, a lot of disease there. It was like a madhouse. I lived in Sana'a, and um, the house they put me in was right across from the secret police headquarters. They did that deliberately to try and intimidate people. At that time, there was a massive drug problem with Escobar. So what he was doing was he was flying aircraft from both Colombia and Venezuela, and the planes were ending up either dropping drugs off the Keys or they were landing in Lakeland in Florida. Now, a lot of the aircraft didn't have the range at the time, so they were landing on South Caicos, which was the next island up from Grand Turk. <clears throat> and the, the prime minister of the Turks and Caicos was actually getting money from Escobar for allowing these aircraft to land there. So what happened was a guy called Barry Seal, he was an ex-Green Beret, and he'd been caught by the DEA for flying drugs um, in and out of Nicaragua. Um, he was told that he had to work with the DEA or else he was going to go to prison. <clears throat> so they set up a sting operation and they brought this guy, Norman Saunders, in a hotel in Miami. And he mentioned how much money he wanted for the aircraft to land. And then he got arrested. Um, Tom Cruise played uh, Barry Seal in the, the movie American Made. So a British detective got sent down from um, Liverpool um, homicide. And he was supposed to be training the locals. But we found out later on, his job was supposed to be tracking Escobar's accomplices who were working in the Turks and Caicos Islands. Now, this guy ended up betraying all of us, as I'll talk about later on. <clears throat> so what happened one day is I was in the house down near the airport, and I get this phone call, and it's one of my mates, a customs officer, and he says, I've just arrested Pablo Escobar's brother-in-law. Um, this is me just heading off to a meeting um, to talk about this. So what happened was a guy called Robert Seri. If you look him up on Google, you'll only find two references to him. Um, the first one's from the British Parliament. So Seri's aircraft landed in Grand Turk. He gets out, Gordon's this unarmed uh, um, uh, customs officer there, and he says, I need to get a plane. So a bunch of planes there, but the owners were all in Miami. Cut a long story short, every time someone came into the island, they had to put their passport in a fax machine that went to McDill Air Force Base where you had the DIA, the DEA and sent. Um, so a message comes back and says, arrest this guy immediately. Well, he basically threatened Gordon. Next minute, two local policemen come up, just pure chance, nothing to do with him. And he realized the game was up. He got arrested, put in the jail, must have paid someone off. He escaped, sent the Delta Force in there, came in the C-130, searched the whole island. They found him unconscious in an attic, <clears throat> brought him down. So now they're going to have a, um, a court case and the Metropolitan Police Firearms Unit got brought out there. Um, what happened was I was at a little beachside bar called the Salt Raker Inn, and I was sat on the table next to this little bloke <clears throat> and a Latino lady. 
So it turns out he was a DA pilot and flown for Escobar for many, many years. And he was there to testify against Seri. Seri is a very unknown yet highly powerful figure. Um, the girl that was there was Seri's former girlfriend, and he'd beaten her up. So she was extremely brave <coughs> sitting there. Now, the problem was this place was right beside the beach. And they'd seen a yacht coming off the coast and Zodiacs zooming around at night. So they were concerned that they were going to put a hit in these people. So they had the Met Police Fire Arm Squad. And um, I'll send a couple of links on that later on um, to after him. So eventually he got put in a C-130 and off he went back to the, the States and got put in witness protection. So years later, I'm in Africa, did seven years in Nigeria. <clears throat> come back to Heathrow one night, put the TV on, and there's Ellie Davis, who was a friend of mine, the Liverpool detective, and it said he'd been arrested for helping Curtis Warren, who was Europe's biggest drug dealer, by passing on information on raids. So that was a huge shock to me. I phoned my wife up. But Ellie used to, I used to have lunch with him every day. So that was, that was a really, really bad situation. So... After I, I met my wife, moved to the States, <clears throat> um, I was working for a contract house out of Melbourne, Florida, putting in satellite systems all around the world, China, Taiwan, Indonesia, <coughs> Chile. Um, this was an interesting one. There's a lot of strange bedfellows in some of these projects. This was in South Korea, just before heading up near the North Korean border on a joint Chinese South Korean projects. So there were some very, very strange ones that went on. So what then happened was <clears throat> I get this call one day, and this is leading into my experience with the Russians. Um, as far as I know, I'm one of the few people in the world who's had direct involvement with an operational Russian military unit. And as you'll hear in a minute, it was certainly not by choice. <clears throat> so I get this call. And um, the guy that was running the, the contract house said, Dave, would you like to go to Tajikistan and put in this um, compressed video system? I said, well, how long is it for? He says, oh, you'll go to the capital, Dushanbe, go to the main satellite station, put in the transmitting equipment, take a day, <coughs> excuse me, then you'll fly up to the Afghan border <coughs> on the Tajik side, put up a VSAT antenna, this is a very small aperture antenna, <clears throat> um, put in the receiving equipment, that's it, back to the stage. Yeah, great. <clears throat> so in those days, this was late 90s, um, the internet wasn't as big as it is just now. And I looked up to Tajikistan, couldn't really find very much about it. <clears throat> so what then happened was I flew from um, Orlando, <clears throat> ended up in Frankfurt, picked up this, British engineer, ex-Royal Signals, who turned out to be a complete disgrace. I'm not going to mention his name, but he nearly got us killed. Um, so we fly from there to Moscow. Um, in Moscow overnight, we go to a restaurant. <clears throat> Excuse me. He gets drunk. There's this massive Russian guy in front of us <clears throat> with his girlfriend, and this guy starts putting his hand in her shoulder. Well, we were lucky we had someone with us. He was a local crime boss, and he very nearly got the two of us killed. And he did other things later on that I'll, I'll talk about. So we arrived there. But on the flight over, I pick up the International Herald Tribune, and there's an article that says certain people taking hostage, peacekeepers in Tajikistan. So <clears throat> I said to the other guy, I said, um, we need to go and find out about this because... When I started off in this project, it was a company called Hughes Network Systems. They're a massive company. Um, it was started by Howard Hughes, the eccentric billionaire. Mm -hmm. And they've got a satellite division. So they not only launched satellites, um, manufactured them, they also did work in ground stations. Now, I went up to Hughes Network Systems. I met with the project manager to get an idea of the job. <clears throat> One of the things I would always ask them is, um, are there any health situations I should know about, disease, et cetera, et cetera, and security? He said, no, 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 it's just a sleepy little country. Everything's fine. So we arrive in Moscow, <clears throat> spend the night in the hotel, 
And I said to this guy, we need to go to the British Embassy and check up on this. So we go to the British Embassy and we say, look, we're heading off to Tajikistan. We're going to do Shanbi and then Korov. <clears throat> so the guy there said, under no circumstances, he says, we're pulling people out of the country. <clears throat> and I said, well, what's going on? He said, there's a brutal civil war that went on for years here, and it is not over. It started up again. Now, as I'll explain later on, Hughes would have known this fine. And it's very interesting how they chose two British guys to go on this. <clears throat> so I said, OK, well, we'll go back. We'll speak to the Hughes rep, this guy Fedorov, and um, we'll say we're just going back to the States because this wasn't explained to us. You know, I'm married now. <clears throat> not a single guy off for adventure, et cetera, et cetera. So very simple. We had no idea at the time how important this job was. It was vitally important. So I'll digress for a minute to give a little bit of background, and then I'll come back to this. So <clears throat> in the 1970s, early 1970s, Afghanistan was very westernized. Girls in miniskirts, women could go to school, to university, have professions. There was bars, restaurants, beautiful, beautiful country. Then it got taken over by a, we'll call them a communist regime. They said they weren't, but they had very close links to the, to the Russians. <clears throat> so this regime took over. Now, up until that point, and it was the same in Iran. <clears throat> I could talk all day about that. I know the Iranians very well. They tried to kill me and this guy here way back in the early 80s in Bahrain. There was a failed invasion attempt on that island. It all got hushed up. Um, and they were going to get rid of all of the Sunni and uh, myself and a couple of other British expats. What they did was, when they came into power, <clears throat> they started land reform and this religion, and that got the local religious leaders upset. So what then happened was there was guerrilla action against the regime that had taken over, and it got really bad. <clears throat> so they reached out to the Russians for help. Now, a lot of people say that the Russians wanted to invade Afghanistan. They didn't. The Russian foreign minister at the time said, this could pull us into a religious war. And that was very interesting because that's a foreshadow of exactly what we're seeing nowadays. <clears throat> so the Russians went in there. Lots of deaths on both sides. A Texas socialite and a Texas congressman changed the whole shape of the war. So I'll explain how that happened. So the Russians were not doing well. So what they started doing was bringing in Hind gunships and Su-25 frogfoot jets. So the frogfoots would come in, they would blast the mountain sites, uh, <clears throat> the gunships, ships would come in and then troop carriers would come in and they would mop up whatever was left. So the Russians had air superiority. So this lady, um, ex-socialite, married to a very, very wealthy guy, knew General Zia al-Haq, who was the strong man in Pakistan. <clears throat> Excuse me. And she worked with a guy called Charlie Wilson. There was a movie made called Charlie Wilson. Arted thing. It wasn't at all. So they established a pipeline that went up through Pakistan and in Afghanistan. I spent six months in Pakistan, maybe talk about that some other time. That was right at the point where Pakistan and India barely came to nuclear war. So I was doing a joint U.S.-Pakistani military project. <clears throat> so the stingers went in there and they started knocking the gunships out of the sky. By this time, I think there was like 18,000 Russian soldiers had been killed. So there was political pressure in Russia from the mothers to finish this war. <clears throat> so the war ends. Osama bin Laden, who was a, <clears throat> he came from a very wealthy Saudi construction family. He was a mid-level leader at the time. <clears throat> he wasn't right up at the very top. He saw that they'd managed to boot out one of the most powerful militaries in the world. And so what he wanted to do was to create jihad that would go all the way from Afghanistan and spread out to all the other stands, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, etc. But the gateway was Tajikistan. 
Now, well over a third of Afghans are of direct Tajik descent. So what he did was he started this civil war in Tajikistan. <clears throat> Excuse me. You have a lot of people there who are basically ethnic Russians. So there was a fight between one side and, and the Mujahideen who were pouring across the Panj River <clears throat> and into Tajikistan. <clears throat> this was a terrible war. This went on for a long time. So it stopped and started. <clears throat> so when it stopped, um, there was peace for a bit, and then it would start up again. So this, this was going nonstop. So anyway, we're in Moscow. All of this is going on, and it hasn't been explained to us. <clears throat> so I go and meet the guy who was in charge of the Hughes office. His name was Fedorov. Typical Russian that you see in the movies. Big bull of a guy. <clears throat> go in, see him, tell him what the British Embassy said, and say, I'm sorry, but we have to go back. Uh, the guy that's with me, he's going back to UK. I'm going back to the States. <clears throat> he says, no, no, you're going. And I burst out laughing. I said, what do you mean I'm going? <clears throat> he said, you will go. I said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going right back to the tell. He says, come in this room and I'll show you some. <clears throat> now, by that time, I'd gone through, I think, about three passports, three or four passports. They were absolutely stamped up to the gunnels. There was no more room <clears throat> for anything. And without going into details, some of the places I'd been were, quote, unquote, rather interesting. He had all the pages laid out on a table <clears throat> and... Most of what I did was civilian type work, but we also did military work and governmental work. And some of that my own family didn't even know about. He had a list of every single job that I'd ever been on. He was a very, very powerful company. And they're a direct contractor to all the three letter US agencies. So he shows me this and he said, now I know you've just moved to the States. You're not a citizen yet. <clears throat> if you don't go, I'll have you blacklisted in the States for all satellite work. And I knew this guy wasn't joking. And that really worried me. I'm a young guy. <clears throat> you know, I've moved to the States. This is a very powerful organization, extremely powerful. He's got all this information on me here. And it was all accurate. It was definitely my passports, jobs that I'd done, et cetera, et cetera. So I went and I phoned my wife. And he says, if you mention one word of this, <clears throat> he says, I'll put the word out and you will not work in the US again. <clears throat> so I couldn't even tell my wife what was going on. Um, so long story short, the other British guy that was with me, he did most of his work in Europe. <clears throat> so he ended up in a right old state, crying and everything like this. So, and he was a drunk as well. <clears throat> so he left and went back to the UK. I then got this guy to fly with me from Moscow <clears throat> and to Dushanbe. His name was Nikolai, a nicer guy you couldn't meet. Um, he was a former Russian soldier. He'd fought in Afghanistan. Um, really nice chap. He was trembling on the whole flight. And I said, Nikolai, what's going on? He says, we have to be very, very careful with these people. Get in the plane, get into a guy called Shavkat Kaliov. Now, <clears throat> in all these countries that you go to, developing countries, you'll always meet someone who's been highly educated, been to Western universities, Oxford, Cambridge, etc., and they run businesses. So this guy spoke very good English. Um, he'd lived in San Diego for many years. He knew Fleetwood Mac. He'd, he'd rented the house that belonged to one of them. Um, he was well-known in social circles, et cetera, et cetera. Very charming, as a lot of them are. <clears throat> Excuse me. But around him, he had all these bodyguards straight out of the movies with the beards and the staring eyes and the AKs, et cetera, et cetera. So I said, what's going on here with the Civil War? He says, no, 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 that's just British propaganda. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're trying to get the British to come back in here. Don't worry about it. <clears throat> so he said, you'll go to the Intersputnik satellite station. So the West has Intelsat, <clears throat> it's International Telecommunication Satellite Organizations, a global organization. And the Warsaw Pact and other countries like Cuba use the Intersputnik system. So there's a big satellite station outside Dushanbe. You're going to go there, put the transmitter in <clears throat> tomorrow, um, you'll fly up to Korog, which is on the border, right on the border of Afghanistan, 
put in the dish, day or two to put that in um, and then back. So I said, well, we're going to be using concrete to put that in. So it'll take a few days for the concrete to cure. He says, yeah, 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 that's fine. He says, and the local guys can take care of it if it isn't. Just put the electronics in. Sounded good. <clears throat> so we're getting one of these old taxis. And in these places, they all look the same all the way around the world. Um, this is this was in one here somewhere bad with something bad going on. These little taxis um, falling apart, springs sticking out the seat and everything. So we get in, the driver's really friendly. Now, <clears throat> there's me, Nikolai, and the driver, <clears throat> and then one of Kaliov's bodyguards who's got the AK, he's sitting in the front. So off we go. And it's, it's a beautiful country, Tajikistan. So we're driving out. As we're driving towards the Earth Station, satellite station, I see this vehicle on fire at the side of the road. <clears throat> and it's obviously been hit by an RPG. So I said, what's that? They wouldn't answer me. So I said, what is that? He said, oh, it's rival gangs here, <clears throat> criminals. Well, I knew this was nothing to do with criminals. Anyway, get the satellite station and it's all this old Soviet stuff that's in there. So I put the transmitter in, <clears throat> working on that, and I hadn't quite finished setting it up. It's getting dark. <clears throat> the taxi driver comes in. No, 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 like that, and they're all yakking away with each other. I said to Nikolai, what's going on? He says, I don't know. I don't speak the language. So anyway, the, the guard comes across, says, we need to go, and we go now. So we get in this taxi. It's like a bat out hell driving down the road. Now I look around, and there's more vehicles that are on fire at the side of the road. <clears throat> so we get back into Dushanbe. It's late at night. I go in and see Kalilov, speaking to him. I said, what's going on here? Oh, no, this is... Two local <clears throat> uh, drug gangs, they're fighting each other, and, you know, they've got the old Soviet weaponry and things like that. So he said, just never mind about the transmitter. He said, some of our guys will, will finish setting that up. You put it in there. <clears throat> you need to fly up to Korog tomorrow. I said to Nikolai, okay, let's just get up there and get this done a couple of days, and then we're, we're gone. So next morning, getting that old taxi, and we drive down to Dushanbe Airport, and we've got all these Tajik airliners there. Um, they go right past the civilian side, and they end up on the Russian military side of the, 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 the airport. I said, what are we doing there? <clears throat> Nick Lai said, well, the Russian Air Force is flying us up. I said, well, I don't fancy the sound of this. So we get out of the, get out of the taxi, and there's a massive Mil-26 helicopter sitting there with a ramp down at the back. He says, we're going up in that. So I said, well, okay. While later, while we're talking, I hear this. <laughs> and there's two Su-25s come screaming above our heads. They turn and bank, and they head for the hills outside Dushanbe. And all of a sudden, I see this tracer coming up. I mean, it's just this wall of fire. These planes are literally built like tanks, and I just see the two of them coming down, and they start firing rockets and cannon, and this just goes on, and they keep going down this hail of fire, and suddenly all the tracer stops. I said to Nikolai, this is really bad. I says, this is obvious. The Russians are involved in this here. Um, <clears throat> we need to get back. So... There was two big Spetsnaz guys there and then some Russian Air Force guys and some mechanics. So I said, Nikolai, you tell them we're getting the taxi, we're going home, that's it. I am not flying in this thing. This thing is a, it's a sitting duck. So he goes and explains it to them, <clears throat> and they are really ticked off. And these are big, intimidating guys. I mean, I'm 6'2", but these guys were these guys were absolutely massive, and of course I'm unarmed. Um, they come across to me, and they're right up in my face, and they're shouting in Russian, and um, Nikolai says, we, we have to. I said, I'm not getting that helicopter. I'm just not. I said, this thing's going to get blasted out. So anyway, big arguments with them. And the next minute, one of the mechanics comes out. They've got an engine problem. And this was an introduction to how the Russians are. <clears throat> Their kit is always falling apart. Now, why is that? Is it because the designs are bad? No, it's not. It's because the maintenance is not done. <clears throat> and as I found out from Nikolai, there's people that steal the parts and they sell them because the Russian military is paid so poorly. And this is one of the things that we're seeing in Ukraine now. I actually offered to talk to some 
Ukrainian military about my experiences with the Russians that might have helped them, and they weren't interested. <clears throat> but anyway, so next thing is, I said, well, how long is that going to take to fix? Because it doesn't matter to me. I, I just am not going to go on that thing. He said, well, they've got a major problem with it. <clears throat> while later, an Antonov 26, which is a turboprop, <clears throat> comes bimbling down the runway. So he says, we're going to go on that. By this time, I'm completely exhausted. I, I hadn't slept in nearly two days. I said, okay, let's just get in this thing, get out here. <clears throat> get in there, and there's a whole bunch of Russian squaddies. Now, these are the same kids that are fighting in Ukraine. They're young, they're scared, they are treated horrifically by the NCOs, as I'll talk about later on. <clears throat> so we get in this plane, take off, I fall asleep. Next minute, I hear this whoop, 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 whoop. And the plane, it's it's moving in all sorts of directions. And this, this klaxon's going off, and the loadmasters come down from the cockpit, and there's all sorts of shouting going on. I said, Nikolai, what's going on? He says, they think there's been a missile fired at us. <clears throat> so he looked out the window. I couldn't see it, but he said he saw this thing coming up, and it either didn't have the altitude or whatever. So obviously this was another sign that things weren't the way that we were told. So <clears throat> the young Russians are all crossing themselves in the plane. They knew fine well what was going on. So we land at Korog, which is a small, sleepy town. There was a philanthropist called the Aga Khan, and he used to build hospitals and things there. So it's just a remote village, cattle, things like that, uh, mud huts, some brick buildings and things like that. <clears throat> so anyway, we arrived. Now, I'd already been through customs in Moscow and Dushanbe. There's a little stand, a little wooden stand, <clears throat> as we get off the plane, and a massive Tajik <clears throat> wearing all this big fur around his neck and a couple of other guys behind him with the AKs. <clears throat> so he says, come, come. <clears throat> and he goes, passport. I said, why does he want my passport? We've already shown this in, in Dushanbe. He says, just do what he says, fine give him the passport, and he looks through it, and then he turns to these other guys, and he's pointing at something. I won't mention the name of the place. And then he looks at me, and he says, you're a British spy. I said, what? <clears throat> he says, you're a British spy. I said, mate, I have, I, have, I have certainly not. I have nothing to do. We're here. To put, and this is for your government. Blah, blah, blah. These two guys grab me, they take me over, big lads, push down, and then one of them has an AK on me there, and he says, we're going to shoot you. And I thought, that's just the end. I didn't even have time to do anything, and then they all burst out laughing. And they thought this was big joke. He says, big joke. So the next minute, <clears throat> a car draws up, and it's some of the local Tajiks and some of the Russians. So I said to Nikolai, you tell them what happened there. Now, I don't know what happened to these other guys. But anyway, they take us into this building and they give us tea and they give us some food. Now, what we didn't know was the Panj River was right outside. So you literally got Afghanistan here, Tajikistan here. You can see right across. You can see the kids playing the other side. <clears throat> they were taking water out of the river and using that for us for drinking water, but the animals were defecating it in further up. So we ended up getting a form of dysentery. We get extremely sick. But anyway, they seemed all friendly. Here's the problem. They can change in a heartbeat, as we would soon see, and drugs were a major reason for that. So <clears throat> we get in there, and um, <clears throat> they said, right, there's a small satellite station here. We want you to go down and take a look at it. So this wasn't the one where we're going to put the dish and that was going to be further away. So I go down, I look in there, and then there was this all this old Russian stuff. There was a, a, a rack of Western equipment there, and I, I knew the manufacturer. And I thought, wow, this is strange. So Nikolai asked one of the guys, who put that in? He said, some Germans. <clears throat> so I go to the back of the rack and I look in. I speak a little bit of German. And there someone's written in felt tip pen, <clears throat> excuse me, inside the rack. <clears throat> and it was the Germans. And it said, we were supposed to be here for a week. We left after a day. <clears throat> These people are crazy. And that was a sign of things to come. <clears throat> so come out of the earth station, <clears throat> and I'm just walking down by the river. And I'm looking across. There's little kids over on the Afghan side, and they're <clears throat> waving, and I'm waving at them, and people doing their business. 
Now, that river, I think it's like 1,500 clicks long. There's all sorts of flat stones there that have been worn out over the years. <clears throat> so I'm just walking down there, you know, to pass the time. And I stand in this stone and I hear click. And the next minute, all hell breaks, breaks loose. The Russians are standing just a few yards away from me. They all start moving back. The Tajiks move back. And, I, and Nikolai shouts, don't move, don't move. I said, what's, what's wrong? He said, you've stood in a mine. So <clears throat> that sent a chill right up the back of my neck. Now, the way I was positioned in this stone, my legs were at an awkward angle. <clears throat> and I stood there for a bit. I said, can they get someone <clears throat> here to put a weight on this or something? I don't know, just, just anything at all. Um, the Russians wouldn't even move. They just stood there <clears throat> and watched me. <clears throat> so after a while, my legs start to shake. And I couldn't step in the, stand the thing any longer. I, and I said, I'm going to step off this thing. So I stepped off. Nothing happened. Turns out they'd planted, when, when the Russians had the invasion, they'd planted all these mines along the river. And this one had been rusted out over the years by the, the water there. But they told me, I think, a week or two weeks before, a young kid had been blown up by one of them. It's still a major, <coughs> major problem. So they, they take me away and they give us vodka and all this sort of stuff. The Russians had tanks that were buried up to the turrets all the way along this, this border. And young kids, and I saw these kids getting treated brutally by the NCOs. This is one of the big problems in Ukraine. <clears throat> in the British military, <clears throat> the soldiers are not treated like serfs by the NCOs in general. There's a good relationship between the NCOs, especially the corporals and the soldiers or the corporals and the marines on there that are under them. And everyone talks about officers and there's all sorts of complaints and things. But in the Russian military, you've got this distinction. The officers, <clears throat> the NCOs and the men. And the men are terrified, the NCOs. NCOs are often drunk. They're often stealing things. They beat the troops terribly. There's zero morale among these young soldiers. <clears throat> Some of them get killed when we were there. They had a heater on inside the turret because we were there in winter um, and the fumes killed them. Um, all sorts of stuff going on. So anyway, I think it was the next day <clears throat> to try and cheer us up. <clears throat> they took us out of these hot springs. They've got these thermal springs there. So we get in this old Russian Jeep. And again, we're not even three miles out and that thing breaks down. <clears throat> so we have to wait till another one comes out. And they're all drinking. There was Russian military, Spetsnaz guys, um, uh, <clears throat> some local Tajiks, myself, Nikolai. So everything was breaking down. I could see that same thing in Ukraine nowadays. So another vehicle comes, we get in that, go to these hot springs, and then we meet with some of the local leaders. <clears throat> this water is scalding hot. So we eventually get in there, the whole lot of us, and we're drinking this vodka and black bread and sausages and all. Oh, they're all, the Russians are all saying, oh, we love America, we love Britain. Yeah, right. <clears throat> so an old fella that was beside me, he's, he's been drinking. The next minute I don't see him, and he fell right underneath the water. So he was so drunk, so we drag him out. Anyway, they're all drunk out of their heads, and the journey back to Cold was unbelievable. So it's some out of a movie, driver falling asleep at the wheel, and you've got some real, real dangerous things at the side of the road. So anyway, <clears throat> we get back and we get into um, we get into Korog. So that night I can't sleep. I've got the beginnings of dysentery. <clears throat> um, I get out of the wooden hut, not the wooden hut, the brick building that we were staying. And I walked down near the river, um, keeping well away from where I was before. Um, and I look and I see these glow sticks in the river leading across to Afghanistan. And the, the river's not all that wide. Um, <clears throat> the next minute, I see these donkeys coming down, right down the side of the, 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 the mountainous area there and down on the ground. In fact, let me see if I've got this picture here. That was, let me see if I can get that. That was me there in front of a 
statue of, um, I think that was Lenin. You can see the height of the mountains there. And that was an interesting thing. I said to one of the Tajiks, <coughs> Lenin, that guy was responsible for executing so many of your people. And they turned around and said to me, yes, but we need a strong father. We respect him. So that's the mentality that they have. So I see these donkeys coming across, <clears throat> and I find out this is the Russians getting drugs from Afghanistan, the military, because they're so poorly paid. They're going to put them on a plane, fly them to Dushanbe, from Dushanbe into Moscow, and then from Moscow into Amsterdam. Now, as I'll talk later on, Angela um, ended up being executed. And one of the reasons, I think, was because we saw what we saw there. So after that, <clears throat> I go back into the room, try and sleep a little bit. And then they say, right, you're going to start to put the satellite dish in. Now, up to this point, Mr. Jakes had been pretty quiet. We saw no sign of violence, <clears throat> nothing like that at all. But there was hashish being used, as we found out later on, and other things. So now the weather's starting to, to, to turn in. There was a container that had all of our kit in it. So the idea was that we dug a hole in the ground. <clears throat> we're going to put a post in, get the concrete put in there, um, get all that sorted out, dish in, do the electronics, and then away home. Well, we were sitting in the container waiting for the weather to clear. Suddenly, the door bursts open. <clears throat> There's all this snow everywhere. <clears throat> and these Tajiks come in. They start shouting and screaming. And I said, what's going on? They say they want us to put the satellite dish up. And they were obviously out of their heads. I could see it in their eyes. <clears throat> so I burst out laughing. I said, I said, if we even step out there, we're going to get blown away. There's no way we can put the dish up. And we've got to put the concrete in. This has to be a step-by-step -step systematic process. Wouldn't take no for an answer. They're screaming. They grab Nikolai, physically grab him here, <clears throat> drag him out, slam the door shut. So he's gone. <clears throat> Comes back a while later, door open, they throw him in. I said, what happened? He said, they've dug two graves for us. <clears throat> and they said, if we don't get that dish up, we kill the pair of us. They sort of calm down a bit. I go back to the room and I said, Nikolai, we've got to get out of here. We have to get out of here. So what I did was I disabled one of the pieces of electronic equipment so it showed red lights on it. And I said, I need to make a phone call back to our office in Melbourne. Well, they managed to get me an old HF radio link, which then went into the satellite system. My wife worked for the Chamber of Commerce, and her father was a teacher to a congressman's secretary, Congressman Bill Arrakis in Florida, quite a powerful individual. Now, I told the Tajiks I was going to phone our office. What I wanted to do was phone my wife, but I had no idea she would pick up the phone. <clears throat> Fortunately, she did. She was working at the Chamber of Commerce, pick up the phone. I had a code that I gave her. And I only used that once in my life, and it meant things are really, really, really bad. You have to get a hold of the State Department or anyone else. <clears throat> Excuse me. Just take a drink of water here. Mm. So the next minute, the line gets cut off. <clears throat> so I said to Nikolai, I said, we've really got to get out of here. <clears throat> so what I did was I went and drank more water, and I got really, really ill. And I said to the Tajiks, we need to get back <clears throat> to Dushanbe. I'm ill. I need to see a proper doctor. <clears throat> and I need to talk to my office about this technical problem. So they all talked among themselves and they said, right, OK, we'll take you back to Dushanbe to get that sorted out. My plan was to get there, get in the next plane and then leave. So. We end up with this old Yak-40 jet, which had a tail ramp come down it. <clears throat> and the pilot comes out, and he's got this massive hat on, and they had a little shack there where people could sit. And this guy's knocking back vodkas. That flight out of there is the most dangerous in the world. It's through a valley, and there's, you can look it up on the internet. There's crashes all over the place. So we get into the plane, me and Nikolai, and then all these people come on, and they've all got these big cotton bundles. You, you see this all around developing countries sitting in their heads. I said, Nikolai, this plane's overloaded. 
and they need to sit down. So they don't, the door of the cockpit's open. The next minute, I hear the engine start up, it's a twin engine jet, vroom, like this. And then the ramp comes up. I said, Dick, like, we need to do something. This plane is going to tip. So he shouts into the cockpit. <clears throat> and then one of them comes out and blah, 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 ramp goes down and they come out. So anyway, plane takes off and it just goes like a cork out a bottle in between the two sides of the mountains. Arrive in Dushanbe. We go in to see Shavkat Kali, obviously. It's all my, my good friend, my good friend. We will uh, uh, help you with your medicine and you phone your office. I said, no, we are leaving. Now, he's in one of these offices that you, you see in all these countries. He's got massive high ceilings, marble everywhere. He sat at a desk and you've got these two characters behind him and others at the side with the case. I said, I'm leaving. <clears throat> I said, we've been lied to. I said, we nearly got shot. I said, I've had enough. I'm going home. He said, no, 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 no. You're our guest. You stay. Now, I'm getting really angry. I already had a, a massive diarrhea. I was infested with lice that had no sleep ever happened to me. I said, I'm not. I'm going home. <clears throat> so he says, you will stay. I said, I'm not. Big shouting match. The next minute I've got this guy, and he's banging me in the back of the head. The I reached around. I grabbed it. There was a whole lot of stuff went on. I said, I'm leaving. He turned around and he said, we will kill you and we'll put your bodies in a car and burn them and blame it on the rebels. And poor Nikolai, he was just, he was in tears because he knew these people were, that they meant what they, what they said. So I had one chance to get out of this and it was a partial bluff that I used. <clears throat> I said, you know that phone call that I made from Korog? I know you know about that. <clears throat> I said, that wasn't to our office. That was to my wife. And her dad's connected to Congressman Bill Arrakis, and he's on the House Armed Services Committee. Whether he was or not, I didn't know. If I don't get out of here, they'll pull the plug on all the assistance to Tajikistan. <clears throat> and that was the only thing that saved us. And then he changes. Oh, my good friend, my good friend. We are just joking. We are just joking. This is play. This is play. I said, I am leaving. So there was a flight in the morning. Now, he had one guy there. He was a Russian, uh, lived in Tajikistan his whole life. Can't remember his name. <clears throat> very, very nice guy. We go to the hotel, and I'm in the room, and I'm hearing all this walking outside the hallway. I was certain, 100% certain, they were going to drag me out of there and they were going to kill me. But that obviously didn't happen. Bang at the door. So I thought, well, I'll open it. It was him. He said, I am so, so sorry. I am so sorry. I am ashamed. Please do not say anything to your people about this. So <clears throat> he says, please eat with me. So we went downstairs and there was this, you get this in these hotels, there's nobody there. There's massive dining room and there's all sorts of full gold stuff all over the place. There's me and him and there's six waiters standing there. It, it, I used to go through this in Pakistan. So one of them comes across and we had, the food was really good. We had some braised rabbit and all sorts of other things. He said, please, please do not tell anyone about what happened. I said, well, I, I can't guarantee you that. I says, this is, we, we've come very, very close multiple occasions to our lives being ended here. So <clears throat> anyway, the next day we drive down. I said, where's Nikolai? Oh, he's being held here. I get in the plane, fly back to Moscow. I'd been told not to say a word to anyone about what happened by this guy, Fedorov. <clears throat> so get back to the States. I go and see this contract house that I was working for. And I'd already been warned not to mention anything about what was going on there. So they only got part of the story. Now I'll fast forward. So 2006, I've done seven years in Nigeria, come back to the States. When I was 20, a guy come through my parachute, back pain my whole life. I disc herniated at the base of my spine. <clears throat> when a chiropractor tried to fix it, he did massive damage. He caused a spinal injury that the doctors have said has never been seen before. Fox News and ABC News came to my house to interview me later on. In a wheelchair, told I would never walk again. I'm a satellite systems engineer, knew nothing about medicine, but I could work out 
mechanical forces, studied how the body worked, figured out what was wrong with me. It was a sacroiliac joint injury, three more discs damaged, tissue torn off my kidneys, et cetera, et cetera, because I didn't have a medical degree. Doctors wouldn't believe me. Found a guy in Tampa, developed a robotic device. I use it to be able to walk each day. Long story short, 1,533 hours of physical therapy over 10 years. So now I spend most of my time helping veterans using that knowledge. So now I'm established in the US and they can't do anything to me. <clears throat> so I told Pam, I'm going to find out about this and get justice. I go back to that company in Melbourne, who's now been bought out by another big company who do a lot of governmental work, told me all the records have been destroyed. I have contacted Hughes Network Systems twice. They have said not one word. They're refusing to answer. The British guy <clears throat> who ex-Royal Signals, BC his name is, his initials, I contact him multiple times. He denies even knowing me. Well, the photographs tell a different story and all the phone calls when he was crying his eyes out in the hotel room drunk, calling my wife back here and calling one of his friends in the US. Won't even talk about this. So what am I going to do? Last year, I met with Riley Wobigan, who is Senator Marco Rubio's chief of staff in Orlando. Now, Hughes Network Systems is a federal contractor. So I'm preparing a document for my senator to question them about this, and they will be forced to give a reply. And I can tell you almost certainly, um, Chris, there's going to be congressional hearings about this. And even though I live in the US, I'm going to get the British Parliament involved in this as well. A massive cover up on everything. And it nearly took my life. So that's basically the story. But the saddest part of all is I had so much information that I could give to the Ukrainians regarding how the Russians are now. The Russians are now as they were in 1996, exactly the same. And I could tell them about how they operate, et cetera, et cetera, but nobody would listen. Mm. So that's basically the story, mate. Where are you living? Where are you living now, Dave? I live in Orlando. Yeah, my wife's American. And <clears throat> we have a lot of medical facilities here that I go to because I, I still have a spinal injury. Um, the guy did so much damage to my spine that I need to get specialized treatment to. Um, to I, I mean, I, I, I have lots of physical problems, but I refuse to let that define who I am. You know, I uh, had two years laying on the floor in the house. Um, but uh, my next door neighbor, bizarrely, was an ex-para, Jack Nuttall. And he used to come in and see me each day, married to an American girl. And, you know, we'd share a few laughs and things like that. But I've refused to let this define my life. Mm. So, yeah, you've uh, done you've done re really well, mate. Really well. Where do you you sound really like certain about the Russians? And yeah. Um, where what where do you get your information on where they're how they're behaving in Ukraine or ah, operating? Yeah, I <clears throat> without I can't say too much, but I have a lot of contacts over the years. Um well, let me tell you something about the Russians. <clears throat> how did this situation with Putin start? Right? This didn't just happen all of a sudden. Let's go back to the 80s. Mikhail Gorbachev is in power, <clears throat> Reagan and Thatcher on both sides of the pond. He was a man, as Thatcher said, that, quote, unquote, we can do business with. So they went to speak to him. They said, look, communism is not working economically or otherwise. Things are changing. <clears throat> we want you to change the whole system <clears throat> and bring down the Berlin Wall. So Gorbachev said, well, what are we going to get out of it? And this is how the West betrayed the Russians. And believe me, I have no sympathy for what the Russians are going through in, <clears throat> in Ukraine. Putin is an animal. And the Wagner group are savages beyond belief. What they've done in Syria and Africa is just horrific. But I met a lot of average Russians, and there's as many good ones, ordinary people, as there are among us. It's their leadership <clears throat> that's the problem, and these thugs at the top. So... Thatcher and Reagan said, 
if you dismantle communism and you bring down the wall, <clears throat> we will provide economic support to your country. But not only that, <clears throat> we will get our best companies, British Steel, British Aerospace, General Motors, Boeing, to come to Russia to look at your old antiquated factories, to get them up and running, <clears throat> and to bring you into the Western fold. A lot of people don't know that later on, Putin actually asked Bill Clinton that he wanted to join NATO. This sounds insane, mm. but why did he do that? Because at the time, China and Russia were at each other's throats. There were border wars going on continuously between both countries, but we'll, we'll look at that some other time. So <clears throat> what happened was they made all these promises to Gorbachev. Now, Gorbachev took great risks. They, they, they were going to assassinate him. The old school communists were making lots of money and they didn't want anyone upset in the boat. And we saw the same thing when Boris Yeltsin uh, was there, when they had that revolution and they started firing on the parliament building, etc. So the democracy nearly collapsed a few times. But anyway, <clears throat> down came the Berlin Wall and a number of things happened. With the dismantling of communism, all of these Russian military scientists who'd been working on NBC stuff, nuclear, biological, and chemical, suddenly without a job. And there's no social security backup. So what did they start doing? They started selling weapons in the black market. And there was a massive rush with MI6, with the CIA and the French Secret Service pretending to be arms dealers to buy this stuff up. How there wasn't a major biological attack around the world, I just don't know. <clears throat> so what then happened was you had the rise of what they call the new Russians. These, and I saw them in Moscow many times. These are these young, flashy guys driving in their Mercedes and BMWs. And one, <clears throat> one time, one night just before I left, on this ice-filled street going to a little restaurant, an old babushka, old Russian woman, all hunched over, and these guys drive through slush and just spray her and laugh. So what happened is you get this extremely wealthy group, the oligarchs, that grew up and have strong political connections. So how did Putin come to power? Because people were angry that they were betrayed. They were told by the West that they were going to get all of this assistance financially and get the country up and running. Of course, when the Berlin Wall came down, the West just said, okay, thanks very much, and they left. <clears throat> so that was a major thing. Then the Russians felt that they were not being respected on in the international stage. Now, I'm not putting up for the Russians, but I'm just seeing how things are, and I know how things are because I've had a lot of connections there with that. The average Russian felt slighted, and that's how Putin came to power. He says, I want to restore pride. Of course, now we find out he's basically just a psychopath. But information was restricted in what went into Russia. During the Cold War, the average Russian did believe that NATO was going to attack them. And when the Berlin Wall came down, NATO promised no eastward expansion. And what have they done? Czechoslovakia, Poland, etc., Hungary, etc., etc. So the West is as to blame for this situation as Putin is. In partial effect, we've created this monster. What's but what's Putin to blame for? Well, I understand, uh, <clears throat> Chris, that there's two sides to how people feel about <clears throat> Ukraine. Um, obviously, there are people in eastern Ukraine, very pro-Russian, etc., etc. Um, I, I don't want to get too much into this here because this this could be a very good discussion for a, <clears throat> for another time. But the atrocities that have been committed is that there's some horrible things have happened. Now, what's happened is the war is at a stalemate. If Putin turns around now and sues for peace, which the Ukrainians, for whatever reason, probably don't want at the present moment. It's an ego thing, <clears throat> and he's going to be shamed. Now, is there the possibility of a putsch where some of his people could throw him out? That's possible. I mean, Russian history is, <clears throat> Russian history is full of this. 
So a very complex situation that's that's going on there. Um, peace of some form has to be the only way out. But of course, that means concessions on both sides and with the losses, et cetera. It's a whole, it, it, it's a whole complex situation. But I can tell you this. The Russians are extremely proud of the country, <clears throat> as are the Ukrainians. But on all sides, it's the leadership. And then in Russia, you've got people who make money off the war. <clears throat> I mean, this Wagner group is so powerful. They make a fortune out of this. They're, they're basically mercenaries, and they've committed horrific atrocities in both Syria and in Africa. But I met two types of Russians. I met some really, really nice people, and then I met people who would literally slit your throat in a heartbeat. And I'll tell you a story about this. So in the limited time that I was in Moscow, after I came back, we did not go and see Fedorov. <clears throat> One of the Russians who worked at the Hughes office came to our hotel, and he was a gentle, gentle soul, a really nice guy, just like the... Russian Tajik who saw me in the last night. And we sat down, we had a few drinks, and he told me something about the new Russians and how things were. His wife had leukemia, and she was being treated in a hospital. And <clears throat> they had restricted numbers of drugs, et cetera, et cetera, because a lot of the stuff was getting sold in the black market. Because people had to make ends meet. When the communists were in charge, Everyone had a little pension, and even though there was food lines and everything like that, nobody was starving, and the government would give them a job, even if it was sweeping streets. When the wall came down, it was chaos. So many people lost their jobs. Well, he was with his wife by the bed, and some of these gangsters, <clears throat> one of their friends had been in a car crash, probably because they were drunk, and there wasn't a bed available for him. I think he had a broken leg or something like that. So what they did was they went through the wards and they see this chap's wife who's getting leukemia treatment. And this brought tears to my eyes when he told me this. They disconnected her from all the tubes, lifted her up, dumped her in the hallway and put their friend in the bed. <clears throat> and he could not do a thing about that. So that is how the society is just now. You have a lot of very upset people, a lot of people who are making a fortune in money, all of these oligarchs, massive amounts of money, but the average Russian is just trying to keep their head above water. So a very complex situation, but we allowed this situation to occur. And let me go back to the whole issue of the Stinger missiles. The reasons the Russians pulled out of Afghanistan was not just because of the Stinger missiles, but it was a major factor. They were knocking these gunships out of the sky, left, right, and center. At the time, <clears throat> a number of British intelligence operatives had said to both MI6 and the CIA and all the other special forces units that were involved in that pipeline, look, we really don't know about the Mujahideen. We don't know what their goals are. Is it going to be sufficient when the Russians eventually leave, either voluntarily or they're pushed out? What are their plans? That was just the beginning of the religious issues. Now, I'll tell you with Iran, I know the Iranians well. I spent three years in, in, in Bahrain. How did the Iranian revolution start? Well, first of all, I'll tell you basically what happened. Early 80s, I was working for this communications company. <clears throat> the Iranians had two hovercraft filled with Iranian Marines. Now, these were very well-trained guys, trained by the British Marines, trained by the US. This is during the Shah's era. When the revolution happened, they had a lot of military aircraft, F-14 Tomcats, F-5s, et cetera, et cetera. Bahrain is divided Sunni and Shia, and Sheikh Al Khalifa, who was in charge, was Sunni. The Shia were treated terribly. I used to go out into the villages and I'd see the poverty there. <clears throat> so the Iranians wanted to invade the island. Now, what they did was they had an agent meeting with a local agent and they had these hovercraft ready to come in. An old man saw a candle on in an abandoned house in Isa town called the police and they managed to grab these guys. 
And it was a British guy who was in charge of the secret police. Now, I would meet him at embassy functions, a real bad piece of work. You can look him up on the internet. So he worked against the Mau Mau in Kenya, and he was Al-Khalifa's chief of police. He took them in. They were tortured horrifically, and they gave up all the information. So what they were going to do was they were going to invade the island. They were going to wipe out the U.S. Fifth Fleet headquarters at Manama, they were going to go all of our communications facilities. My name was in a list along with a bunch of other British guys. It was nothing personal. It was just they wanted to get rid of certain people. And they were going to kill all of the Sunni engineers at what satellite station. Well, <clears throat> because this was found out, um, of course, the invasion didn't take place and the whole thing was hushed up. Um, short while later, there's an interesting story. Our satellite station, big 100-foot diameter antenna, we're carrying a lot of government military communications. One day, shortly after that, we get massive interference, and it was affecting all of the circuits. So I'm a young engineer. I looked in the spectrum analyzer. I said, that's a military radar. Now, the satellite station was called Raz Abu Jarjur. It means head of the shark, and it was out in the desert area. Nothing there. And they all laughed. They said, there's no radar out. I said, I'm telling you, it's a military radar. <clears throat> so what do I know? <clears throat> so they bring in these guys from RACAL in the UK. All these experts are doing all this scanning, can't find out what it is. I said, I am telling you that is a military radar. I'm looking at the pulse repetition frequency here. Anyway, one day one of the locals comes in, one of the drivers. Blah, 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 blah. I said, what's going on? He says he sees a man popping out of the desert. Well, it turned out that the U.S. had come in the middle of the night. They dug in and they put an air defense radar in because they were worried that the Iranians were going to do an attack on the island. So we contacted the U.S. embassy there and then that all got stopped. But the Iranians, so how did the revolution start? Way back in the 50s, there was the Anglo-Persian Oil Company. <clears throat> this was a British company that was pumping oil out of Iran, and they had a democratically installed president there. But the people were treated horrifically by this company, and unfortunately, it was Brits that did it, and we have to be honest here. So the people were treated horrifically. What then happened was <clears throat> the president said, or prime minister, we're going to nationalize the oil company. <clears throat> we're going to put the British and Americans out, and we're going to keep this for our people. Look up Operation Ajax. You can actually write to your MP about this. This was when the British government went to the US, went to the Central Intelligence Agency, and said, we want to get this guy removed. So there was a coup, and they installed a puppet leader into the country. They got rid of the democratically elected president. The Shah came into power. Now, this guy was an egomaniac. At the time, there was no religious issues there. He had the Savak, the secret police. Instead of being a benign leader and looking after his people, <clears throat> first thing he did was he went after the mosques and the, the religious leaders, the Ayatollahs, who were saying this man is not good. He's spending millions on gold thrones. He's flying his family all over the world. <clears throat> the wealthy are getting wealthier. The poorer are getting poorer. So he then clamped down on the religious leaders who up to that point had not been aggressive and causing terrorist issues, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so time went on. He was spending more and more money. People were getting poorer. They were getting tortured in prison. And that's how the Iranian revolution started. So all of these things, I mean, I've been over 135 different countries and territories traveling on vacation, working. <clears throat> I've seen all sorts of people from Asia to South America, Central America, Europe, Australia, all, all over. And, and, and I've always seen wars coming. And they're all for very simple reasons, Chris, not complicated. The Falklands War, for instance, could easily have been avoided. When you have an invasion, you don't just suddenly make a phone call and say, right, lad, show up at the port tomorrow. There are things that take place, a massive increase in communications traffic, live ammunition getting loaded on board, fuel supplies coming, troops getting called up. Um, the intelligence was there, and it was chosen to be ignored. 
So all of these things, you know, that the, 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 there's very rarely a war that just suddenly appears out of nowhere. There are things that lead to it. And <clears throat> because of my work overseas, it was rather unusual. Um, one day I would be out in a remote village, <clears throat> talking to the villagers, sleeping in a hut, helping them with a communication system. The next night I would be at the British Embassy, meeting Prince Charles or uh, uh, whoever, you know, local ministers and defence ministers and things like that. So I was able to talk to a whole different strata of society from very, very poor to very, very wealthy and seeing all the differences in how they understood how their country was. But the best intelligence comes from the poorest people. They are the ones that are aware of where all the grumblings are the ones at the higher level are, are insulated from that. So what do you make then? You see, my, my take on it is, as you say, encroachment by NATO, which they said they would never do, and it was agreed that they shouldn't do. The shelling of the Donbass for since, what is it, 2012 or 14 or something. And... You know, the red flag for me is Ihor Kolomoisky, who's no doubt, no doubt in my mind, high-level mafia, uh, <clears throat> brought his puppet Zelensky into power. The same mafia that those two work for control NATO. And they're playing us all. Putin works for them as well because he went along with the whole COVID narrative, um, put, putting that trauma on his people. So they're all in it together. And I think until we call them all out for what they're playing at, we're, you know, we, it, it's, it's 1984 personified, Dave. We're, we're just going to keep seeing these silly... I don't know if proxy war is the right word. And until we realise Russians, I, I've always got on well with every Russian I've met. Great time in Russia. I've met wonderful Ukrainians. Every country. I haven't travelled as extensively as yourself, but I have, I have, you know, been to all seven continents. And I... I you know, we've got to stop being played by the media because all of the they work for the mafia. Yeah. They work for the global mafia. And until <clears throat> people can see it, they're now Biden, again, puppet, uh, uh, puppet. They're now talking about sending depleted uranium. I think they already have to Ukraine. UK, we can't afford to keep our old people alive this winter. They can't afford their heating bills. We've sent 110 billion to Ukraine instead of wow. peace. Instead of peace talks, right, which were on the table, and it's my understanding Putin actually, uh, you know, said he was up for that. No, we've sent 110 billion. We're now sending depleted uranium. Putin's going to make a speech in five days' time to address the nation. What the hell is he going to say in that when, you know? This depleted uranium is a further act of war. Is he going to, you know, he could escalate this to a serious international level. And the, 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 sorry to say it, folks, if you're watching, but the gullible brainwashed British public, along with the Americans and, and the global community, will, they don't get it. They don't understand that all, they're all being played, you know? Money is a money is a very important thing, and <clears throat> excuse me, if you look at political campaigns around the world, <clears throat> an average person cannot become a political leader. <clears throat> they have to have money behind them to run the campaigns, and that all comes from special interest groups who are not just going to give that money away and say, "Okay, thanks very much," and off you go. Once that person is in power they're going to come knocking at the door looking for, <clears throat> excuse me, looking for favours. Yeah, I don't course. trust any politicians, Chris. <clears throat> no matter how some of them might be nice people, <clears throat> but they're all led, they all have their own agendas. Yeah. 
all it's of not, them. I don't even think it's so much that, Dave. It's the fact that they only they've only been allowed to get to where they are because a they're blackmailable. And B, they're bendable, you know, they're controllable. We saw this with Tony Blair. You know, Tony Blair's criminal record is never discussed. Um, you know, and it's uh, <laughs> it's uh, centers on deviancy, can we say? Not not hard to see why the Americans bent his ear to to take us into Iraq. Um so yeah, I'm I'm just, you know, I'm I'm always hesitant to take size, Dave, because I see the whole, I see it all. Good enough. I Trust see it, I see it enough. all. You know, Putin's <laughs> clearly a, a, a egomaniac to be in power as long as he has. He don't want to go nowhere. I get that. But he's also been injecting his people with a, you know, a certain procedure, can we say, and wearing silly things on their face. He's in it as much as they're... Uh, He's in in this scam as much as they all are. And, um, yeah, I think um, all they're doing, Dave, they're taking us away from the spiritual, from our spiritual selves. They're taking us so far away from love because they know once people grasp love, it's all over for them. It's all over. People love each other. That's fact. I, I you know, for the for the vast most part, that's my experience everywhere I've ever been. And they don't want that because enlightenment all centers on under, understanding that we're one consciousness, we're life experiencing itself subjectively in these 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 bodies. I think it's way more <clears throat> way more powerful than Putin's, certainly way more powerful than Zelensky. These 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 chaps are sociopaths that work for the mafia they'll destroy these countries because they're they have no allegiance to these countries their no. allegiance their allegiance is to well satan you know they, they 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 to money to greed to the destruction of men women and children to the destruction of the church to the you know the, the it, and and uh <laughs> yeah so ah uh, Ah, Dave, listen, this has been a great chat. I hope we can have many more. You've had a fascinating life, haven't you? Well, what? it feels like I'm talking about someone else's life here, Chris. You know, it's this young lad from Kidloch Leaven mm. <clears throat> where the most exciting news was Mrs. Mackay's cat had gone missing. You know, that, <laughs> that kept us going in conversation for about a week. It, it's, it's bizarre, Chris. It really is. But... One thing, hopefully, that we could do is uh, perhaps do a talk sometime, but the work I'm doing helping veterans who have back pain based on my own <clears throat> injuries. I've helped over 400 of them and how 90% of back pain cases do not need surgery. So yeah. perhaps we, yeah. could, we could, I could share all the information I've gathered over the years. I've got a few lads in Britain that I'm on WhatsApp with, I'm helping them with their, their back pain and I've got a load of resources because the doctors don't understand the mechanical reasons for back pain. And I can cover that and I can talk about how my long, long journey to get well and the mistakes I made and all the wrong information that's put out there about back pain. Because <clears throat> Afghan changed everything. In World War II and in Vietnam and in Korea, the troops were not carrying massive big backpacks. <clears throat> they were carrying light packs mm -hmm. and were dropped off somewhere. You see all these lads who were in Afghan, body armor, massive bergens, all bent over, some of them carrying their own body weight. <clears throat> now, what that does is it contracts the muscles. When a muscle is overused, it gets shorter. So when it gets shorter, it pulls the bones out of position. And when that alters the spinal curves, it puts pressure on the disc. There's a lot more to it than that. But mm. the thing is, long-term carrying a Bergen bent forward with these muscles getting tight, there are ways to release these muscles. But the first thing is to do an analysis. I'm an engineer. I used to I design and test satellite communications networks. So I worked in big 100-foot diameter dishes weighing 400 tons. So I had to understand mechanical systems, and that was how I diagnosed my own condition. What happens is 
the vet comes home from <clears throat> Iraq or Afghan or whatever, and he's a young lad, right? He starts getting pain. He goes to the doctor. He'll maybe get a little bit of physio. Then the pain gets worse. He gets given pills. He's got PTSD. The pills make him worse. He starts arguing with his wife. <clears throat> he ends up getting a divorce. He argues with the people at work. He loses his job. He needs more pills. He gets caught in this cycle of depression. And I know this because I talk to these vets all the time. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that can get done to break this cycle is to see if there are muscular issues involved. And I will tell you this. Over 35% of all the guys who kill themselves, all the British and American vets, pain, physical pain is a major component of that. Now, <clears throat> there are psychological reasons for body pain as well, but that's only a tiny amount. Most of it is muscular caused by these guys carrying their big packs, being dehydrated. There's no way any of these lads out in those theatres are drinking enough water to keep themselves completely hydrated. And there you go. You're doing a good thing just now. <clears throat> when I was overseas, I can barely remember drinking a glass of water. I was on the drinking all night, rum and coke out in my mate's beer. Next day, it was cans of coke, tea and coffee. Yeah. The diuretics, they remove more water than you put in. So I would only be drinking every now and then. So that there's me and I have a whole list of resources of good people in the UK that I've sent veterans to. I make not one penny of this. I've never accepted a penny from anyone because no one was there to help me when I was ill that can help people. And maybe we can do a, a chat about that sometime. Yes, we can certainly do that. Um, Dave we're, and friends, we'll, have you got a, a contact that we can put below the video so people can yeah. get? How, have you have you got a Facebook or so? Or? Yeah, it's um, <clears throat> it's Dave Hutch. <clears throat> so my name is Hutchison. Yeah, Dave Hutch. Dave Hutch. Yeah, and you'll see me. There's a picture of me when I was young, standing in front of a C-130 with a parachute on. So they should be able to see that. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if anyone is suffering from back pain. And they've been to the doctor, mm. and the doctor says nothing more can be done for them. Um, they can reach out to me. I, I do this all in my spare time. Um, I'll try and get in touch with them. I do a lot of stuff in WhatsApp. It's easy. I can just get on there, take a look at them. And I've written two documents on back pain explaining it to veterans. Um, it's in PDF format. I don't know how we can put that up. But um, if they, my, my Facebook page is Dave Hutch. So how did I form this Facebook page? <clears throat> Excuse me. It wasn't really for friends and family. It was because I saw a lot of Facebook pages with vets where there's a lot of arguments going on and shouting and screaming. And, <clears throat> you know, I, I thought, I don't want that. I want a place where injured veterans can come <clears throat> and get a little bit of military humor or dark sarcastic military humor, <clears throat> a little bit of information on science, on history, <clears throat> nature, something that's not controversial. And as a result, I've got over four and a half thousand vets in there. One of my favorite groups are the Vietnam vets. I've got so much time for them. I, I go up and shake their hands every time I see them at Walmart. Um, Florida's full of them, wonderful people. They tell you just how it is. And when they came back from Vietnam, they were treated so badly, horribly. They're, they're wonderful people. <clears throat> so most of the people on my Facebook page are vets, Americans, Aussies, British, Australians, lots of Royal Marines, Paras, SAS, uh, all sorts of people there. So it's just a page where they can come and scroll through and see a few things that are interested. Nothing controversial. I want to make it a safe <clears throat> landing place for people. Yes. Dave, we've got to end it there, but thank you so much. Stay stay on the line so I can thank you properly. Oh, you're S welcome. Story is, your story, uh, uh, thank you for telling it. It's absolutely amazing. Friends at home, if you could like and subscribe, click the notification bell. We'd really appreciate it. Um, we'll see you soon. Thank you.